I'm Gretchen Ohl. I'm the manager for NICOR Gas for our meter modernization program. My focus has been on deployment. Um, and this is how to uh, run an aggressive module deployment, or as I like to say, I'm Gretchen Ohl, and this is how I roll. <laughs> so our vision. NICOR Gas has about 2.2 million customers, and we're in a transition. Currently, we have about 180 meter readers that read or, uh, manually walk by and read our meters. This allows us to get an actual read every other month, and then we build to an every other month read. Well, NICOR customers weren't really happy with that, so we're in the transition of actually installing our census AMI two-way telecommunication device on, our, uh, on all our meters. So now we can get an actual read daily, and we can bill now to a uh, monthly actual read. So our mission, our mission is really, really simple. It's to get the census network up and running and in install 2.2 million modules by the end of 2020. So if census is in the room, uh, you might beg to differ. Um, we're kind of deploying first and getting network going second, but it's still our mission and pretty simple. So our team. So NICOR as a whole, um, we started with just a handful of people, but now at any given day, we have 120 to 140 resource, resources working on the project. What do they de do? Well, we're already billing to reads. That was quick. Uh, there are a lot of things what we're doing. We're doing accurate reads. Done. Easy. So what else are we doing? Well, this week alone, we're installing about eight pressure gateway systems um, for pressure censoring. So we're starting that technology. We're looking at some cathodic protection, as well as, hey, can Southern Company roll onto this? Um, we're looking at that. Every day, we're building on to what's being done. That saying, it takes a village to raise a child, <clears throat> takes a whole bunch of people to run a project. Um, Sandy Garcia is our orchestra leader. She keeps us all going. Um, Cindy Nelson, if she's here, she's our techno, techno lead. This is the largest technology-based program that Microgas has ever had. It's huge. Um, Mike Evans is here. He's our AMI Ops. Now they're getting reads and stuff. What are we doing with them? How come it's out of sync? I mean, there are a ton of people that are on this project that make it work. My team, not so big. I have four supervisors. Um, two are my conduits. What do you mean by conduits? Well, uh, we have 2.2 million modules to install. Guess what? I can't do it internally. I only have a year, two and a half years to do it. So we had to get EPI vendors. So we've got two contractors that are actually doing the installs. So my two supervisors, my conduits, hey, you guys, give me a deployment plan. Guess what? Your deployment plan's not working. Redo it. Um, they're on them constantly. But how are you getting this work done? Are you getting it done correctly? And they both have other jobs. So one um, has a lot of meter reading knowledge. So when we brought on drive-by solutions, he was a perfect fit to work with our drive-by solution. Um, and he also helps our measurement team with their deployment as they're coming on to deploy in the same areas where they were doing. The second one um, has an audit team. So we go to our municipalities and say, you know, NICOR Gas, we do 95% of our own work. But th with this project being so big, we can't do it. So we are having contractors do it. So very early on the project, and you'll hear me say that a lot, very early on the project, um, we realized that we don't have NICOR people that could be watching these EPI vendors do the installs. So we had to get an audit team. So we had to train them to say, is this contractor doing what they said they're going to do? Are they treating our NICOR uh, customers with dignity and respect like we did? Are they trampling their flowers? Are they leaving trash? So we've got a whole audit team out there doing that. And then I have two other supervisors um, that are more boots on the ground, field supervisors. So since we're touching 2.2 million meters, it was brought to my attention. It's like, hey, are any of them energized? Do we have electric going to any of them? I don't know. So now we've got Volt. They have to do test before touch. So they're making sure our contractors are doing this test before touch. Again, they're kind of doing audits on our EPI installers. Um, as well as we've got an internal group, my SME group. So they, they watch over our internal installers. But they also have a really, really special job, customer refusals. So the EPI vendor couldn't get things installed. We've got customer refusals. EPIs, they sent out their three letters. They did their final attempt. It still came back to NICOR gas saying, we, couldn't, we can't install here. Customer doesn't want it. Well, my supervisors have the awesome task to go out and try to get those customers installed. Well, first of all, they're NICOR gas. So the customer likes them already. They're not a random EPI vendor. They know who NICOR is, so they like them. Um, and they know about the module. They're better versed in it. They can talk to it. So um, these supervisors were at almost a 90% um, installation rate. Whether they talk to the customer and get it installed, 
or they install and race out, but they get it installed, <laughs> so we're getting it done. Um, and then it says I have three analysts, I don't, I have two. Um, I've got an inventory analyst, and again, very early on, um, I started with 10,000 modules that sat for a while, um, but we started buying a lot of modules. I didn't have EPI, EPI vendors installing. Um, one day I had a truck come through NICOR Gas, and they're like, Gretchen, you got a delivery. I don't, I don't have any place to put it. So someone overheard me and said, well, we've got a warehouse down the street. Um, thank goodness, because now we have 300,000 modules sitting at this warehouse. So my inventory analyst, he's another kind of orchestra director. So we have, between our EPI installers, they have multiple warehouses. So he gets uh, inventory to all the multiple warehouses, as well as our SMEs. So my SMEs are throughout the territories. So he has inventory moving all the time. My second analyst grew from the inventory analyst, and she has a wonderful task of our universe of work. So now we have all this work. We have SME work for internal installs. We have contractor work. So we've got work that's coming back to us saying, we tried to install this and we can't. Whether the meter needs to be exchanged and it needs to be moved out. So she kind of works with all that work. And then once we get it to the contractor to get that meter work done, it comes back to us. Now we have to get it out to get it installed. Does it go back to an EPI vendor? Are they still in that area? Or do we have NICOR installers do it? And she's got a big universe of work. Um, so those are our analysts. And then I have a third person that works with the contracting group that's doing the meter work. So um, that work is growing too. She's got one field person that's out, and they're making sure the contractor's doing the way NICOR gas would do it. Are they building the meter set the way they should? Are they following our spec? Um, she has one person soon. I think we're going to have six or seven because that work is really growing. Um, she also looks at all the DPRs, the boring stuff that I didn't want to do, um, going over their daily progress reports. How many are they getting done? Are we billing correctly? Um, so she's doing that part of it. And then my SMEs. So we've had meter readers that rolled off. Right now we're currently about 30, um, and they've got plenty of work to do. So we go out and install on a meter. It gets certified. It gets filled. And then operations comes and goes and exchanges that meter. Well, now we don't have a module on a meter. It's already being billed. So what do we do? We have to go back out and reinstall. Or Mike Evans sends me a thing and says, Gretchen, this reading isn't in alignment. Can you go out and reprogram a module? So I send us me out to go reprogram a module. So this is going to continue to grow. Um, we didn't think we'd have it, but we've got it. So they're part of my team. So NICOR as a whole, we have a whole bunch of stakeholders. Um, we knew right away a couple of them are obvious. Meter reading, we're affecting them. Uh, Vita sets are billing, we affect them. Um, the meter shop. Now we've got meters with modules coming in. What do we do with them? Guess what? In January, they're going to get new meters with modules on them. What are they going to do with it? So we're building all those processes and what's going on. Our resource management, what's a SME? I don't know. I've got 30 of them, and we've got work. You've got to just get it work to them. So we're growing as we go, and we touch um, all these different stakeholders at any given time. So NICOR is part of Southern Company, and now we've got 9 million customers. There's 11, basically, electric and gas utilities, and four of them are gas-based. So we have Atlanta Gas and Light, Chattanooga Gas Company, Virginia National Ga Natural Gas, and Southern Company Gas. So does this make a difference? Well, yeah. So our local LDCs, um, they have ERT. So they have an ERT ticket. So their work management, they're using ERTs. We don't have ERTs. We have AMI. So how does that work? Are we going to make just an AMI ticket while they're using an ERT ticket? It doesn't make sense. Because sooner or later, and more sooner than later, they're going to roll on to AMI. So how can we merge this? So we're making some common terminology. So we came up with the ARD. It's like, what's an ARD? It's not an AMI. It's not an ERT. But it's an automatic reading device. So it's a common ticket that not only are we going to use for the module that's installed, but maybe we can use it for that smart gateway or the technology for um, the rectifier fields. So it could be used for multiple different things, one ticket type. So everyone agreed, and it started about two months ago, our new ARD ticket. So we're getting ready for everybody to jump on board. So how do we make the magic happen? Well, it's the network build. That's the start. So even this slide's not up to date. So we think we're going to need about 160 base stations. So this is what I call the little engine that could. We did a lot of chugging up real slow. Took a lot of time to get up to that peak. Um, but we're getting there, which is good news. So, wow, 20% are NICOR facilities. Awesome. We had some NICOR towers that were really tall, but we hadn't touched them in over 15 to 20 years. They were used for the CB radios for emergencies. Um, we hadn't been out there. Can we use them? 
Some of them we had to rebuild, but some of them were in good standings and we could reuse them, and it's, they've got great coverage. NICOR buildings, we've got quite a few, and it's a quick hit, we've got the NICOR buildings. Oh, our antennas are only 40 feet tall. Not a lot of bang for a buck, but we got it. Um, and now we need our third-party sites, and this is what's been so painstaking for us. Um, it takes a long time to get leases, to get people to respond to you. Um, we're kind of the last person to the race, so maybe there's no more room on the end. Maybe they just don't care. Um, but we are slowly getting responses, and now that we're getting leases signed and it's getting rolled on, well, guess what? You need an electric, electric line run, or you need an electric meter. Are we talking to the right company to get that meter expedited? Are we working with the municipalities to see what they need? Um, or are there bird nests sitting there and we can't do anything until the darn birds fly away? I mean, there are a lot of things that have happened that we've seen that we're working through. Um, but in the last month or two, it's really started to pick up, so, which is good news. And the other thing is, not only because we need the network up and running, we need modules installed, we need to roll meter reading off, but more than that, we need census to get in here. We need to say, okay, everything's up and running, we've got modules installed, we've got an issue, you need to come here and fix it. But we can't do that yet because we don't have it all up and running. So our focus um, is really shifted to getting this network up and running and getting areas closed so we can get census in to say, okay, is there an issue and can we fix it? So now that we've got network up and going in some areas, most areas, um, it's the installation that's coming. So this is one of our SMEs. Between the EPI vendors and um, NICOR, they basically do the same thing. However, they do it in different, different platforms. The EPI vendor has a phone. And it's been kind of a point of contention because they have double entry. So we had a lot of issues early on with double entry. They're getting better at it. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of the same. We use the Nomad handheld Tremble. Um, they both use the command link. And we do virtually the same thing. And forgive me if you guys already know this, but I'll tell you what it anyway. So um, we don't ever say smart point. Nope, no smart points in our vocabulary. Um, it's AMI. It's a module. And so when I go talk to municipalities and other places and try to explain what it is, if anything, it's a dumb meter. It's asleep, and people don't understand it. So once they get the module installed, they go out, they take the index off the meter, they take the dial glass off the meter, the index off the meter, put the index back on the module, and put the module on the meter, it's still asleep. It doesn't know anything. So now comes the fun part, so, and the accurate part. So they scan the FlexNet ID, wakes, wakes up that module. So now it's telling it what it is. It's like, hey, now you're a four dial module. You're on, you're on this meter. You're reading at a two foot drive. And this is the read you're starting at. And then it's ready, set, activate. And hopefully most cases, it emits a read. Some cases we get a no base station found, but that's okay. But it gets up and going. So now that we've got network up and going and we've got modules activated and reading, we're starting to see some anomalies. So some areas we know we don't have coverage and we don't have meter readers, how do we get those reads? And in other areas, we've got, we got um, something up and running um, and we've got things activated, but they're like little clusters or things that we're not getting reads from, why? And it really interested me, Carl and I were driving in first, our first program to see what drive-by looks like. And I'm like, how come that one's not reading? That one is and that one's not. So I jumped out and looked at it and, active, and interrogated it. It's not activated. I'm like, are you kidding? I mean, they're doing a great job installing, but now you're not activating? So by the time we, we decided to go by drive-by, it, it, it saved us. Um, right away, we found over 5,000 that weren't activated. I'm like, you're kidding, right? We've already paid you, you've installed. Guess what? Go back and activate. I don't care if you're out of the area, go back and activate. So since we found that we've been able to do a daily Delta file every day, so if they're in their area installing and they didn't activate, we're catching it and they're going back now in a more timely, but it hurt them at first. I gotta go back on all these, yep. So drive-by was super to capture that kind of information. Um, and we also had something that very interesting. Um, we thought first once a drive-by, always a drive-by. But then it's like, why? Why can't we build to a drive-by read? I mean, it only makes sense, it's a real read. So we started a different uh, certification process to build off of that drive-by read. So once we started billing off, our routes started going down. So you may have had 300 routes or reads in one route, and now it doesn't download to FCS anymore. No, read to, no reason to drive by, so our 300 meter route would now be 20. Is it worth us driving 20 route, 20 reads? Not really. So we started to shift 
how we did our drive-by and move it into other areas. Also, we got a call from one of our southern offices that's borderline Chicago. And they're like, hey, Gretchen, we know you're not going to be down here for some time, but we're having an issue. Um, they call it domestic terrorism, but really it was huge gang activity. And they're like, we have no police to support us, but we have to hire our own security company, especially in these three towns, to protect our meter readers, and we don't even think that's really working. Is there a way you can utilize drive-by and help us out? Um, and I'm lucky, like I said, one of my supervisors is very immersed in meter reading, and stars aligned, billing windows aligned. Um, we got that call on Wednesday, and that next Monday, we were able to shift to start reading in that area. Uh, we also had EPI vendors already installing there and some network up. So right now we're about 80% um, deployed, not just in those three offices, but that whole office. We want to protect everybody. So we're about 80% um, installed, 70% are by drive-by, 30% are from network, um, and then we're going to get some RTU, but our goal is by the end of this month to have that total office closed down so meter reading will never have to walk it again. So that was a super, super win for us with a drive-by. And we also get amazingly 20 to 30,000 reads a day. We don't really need the reads, we've got them, but it's interesting to see what the drive-by did for us. Um, I spoke about certification. So as things move and progress, um, certification has changed. And what does it mean? Well, basically, we have an R and I read, we've got a drive-by read, they're a little bit different, but the certification is kind of the same. So is this premise, is this FlexNet at this premise that we see in our billing? Is it with this uh, customer? And is it reading correctly? Is it in line? And are we getting that read on a very regular basis? If it meets all this criteria, then we certify it and we let it be billed. So early on, we thought, okay, it's going to take us 60 to 90 days to get all this criteria figured out. Well, as we've gotten better and kept tweaking and kept tweaking and kept tweaking, now we install anywhere from 14 to 30 days we're ready to build. Our deployment strategy. Um, some people would say we didn't have a deployment strategy, but I beg to differ. Um, in 2017, we had a base case that was a race, business case that was developed and a race, rate case filed, um, and we had 10,000 modules. Great. I came in 2017 in November. I joined the team, didn't have an idea what I was going to do, um, didn't know we were using contractors, didn't know we didn't have any uh, contracts with the contractors. Did, I didn't know we had 10,000 modules, didn't know where they were. Um, surely didn't know I was going to be in endless process meetings, endless process meetings, um, and contract meetings. We sat in these process meetings with contractors or consultants that had a lot of knowledge. They had been on other deployments, but it was apples and oranges. They came from AMR to AMI. So I'm sitting in these meetings listening to this stuff, and they're saying, you know, Gretchen, your FO department is going to hate you. They're going to shut you down because you're going to have so many gas leaks. I'm like, wow, I don't think so, but they're, yep, it's going to happen. And you're going to exchange all these meters because screws are going to break on every single meter, and you're going to have to go and exchange all these you know, meters, and they're not going to like you. And then your customers aren't going to like you because they don't want this module installed. I'm like, wow, there's a lot of people that aren't going to like me. Um, I don't know about this position. And I'm really tired of these process meetings. So I went to our labor, labor relations group. And I'm like, is there any way that we can maybe upgrade some of our meter readers to say, is this stuff really true, what these people are telling me? Because I don't think so. But I, I can't base it. I don't know. So they agreed. And I got four uh, most senior meter readers that we upgraded. Um, and we knew sooner or later we're going to have to do this work. Uh, we're just going to bring it up, move it up a little forward. So um, that's what we did. The first thing I did is I had to teach them about meters. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? They're meter readers. Well, yeah, they know how to read a meter. But they don't, don't know what the difference. What's American 225 and what's a Rockwell Census 415? Well, they had to know because our modules are meter manufacturer specific and size. So we went to meter 101. I held it in the yard for some days. Um, and then we brought in a bunch of old meters that we knew we'd have to work on. Um, but I still didn't know exactly what we were doing. So I reached out. I hope Jay was here, but he's not. So Jay from Grubner came and gave us a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm like, Jay, how do we install this? You know, what do we do? How do we activate it? And we worked with our training center saying, we're going to need this sooner or later. So can you jump on to this training session and then start building that process? So we got trained on how to install and how to activate the module. Well, we had one big tower, NICOR Tower Awesome. 
And then we had one office with an antenna, not so awesome, 40 feet tall. But we did have some network, a little bit. So we had an office to work out of. Um, and we're getting people kind of excited. What are you doing? What's a SME? It's like, well, we're doing work. So what we decided is in that one office, we pulled, pulled four meter reading routes. Everybody got a route. Um, they were 99% outside and all customer um, residentials. So for a week, we worked internally. We are working on installs on the old meters. Um, and we sent our communication out saying, hey, NICOR Gas is going to come and do a project in your area. So um, we got comfortable. We went out and started installing in those areas. First day, I got a SME calling me. It's like, oh, God, Gretchen, the customer's out here. I'm like, oh, really? I said, well, I've got these FAQ sheets, all these facts that we can give them. You know, you can rip it off and hand it to the customer and make them call them. I'm like, oh, that's not it. They're like, oh, you know, our electric's been done, our water's been done. We've been waiting for gas. I left the gate open down there if you want to go install. I'm like, oh, cool. They weren't upset. They're like, no, they were excited. Check one out the list. They weren't mad. They were happy that we were there. Um, and we were seeing some screws being broken, but we got vice grips. We got other tools. We were able to mitigate a lot of that. Um, we did see about 2% that something had to be done, but not a huge, huge thing. Um, out of the 871, we had one gas leak, one. So it wasn't these huge numbers that they were saying. Um, we did come across some things. Um, in our system, we had an American 225. Um, we went out there, and it wasn't an American 225. It was this 5B meter. It passed 225 cubic feet of gas, but it was a 5B meter. So I went to Hobby Lobby, and I got a bunch of cork. I'm like, maybe I can make this work. It didn't work. I couldn't get it to fit. So we sent it to Census, and Census actually sent it out to England. And they gave a laser print and kind of, hey, Gretchen, proof it's not going to work. I'm like, shoot. OK. Well, there were only 11,000 5B meters company-wide, so not huge, not a terrible thing, but something we didn't expect. Um, and then we came across a two-screw two spreg. So we have about 68,000 spreg meters in our territory. But we don't have any way to determine what's a two-screw spreg and what's a three-screw spreg. So we had to give them out to everybody, and then we get them back as an RTU. But in this 871, between all the different things, we had about 17 pieces of work that we worked with our FO department to come and do, exchange the meter or move the meter so we could get the module installed. So 2% wasn't too bad. So come April, clouds parted, sun shined. We got contracts signed. Census signed. Our EPI vendors signed. So our first EPI vendor was Union. So what was nice about them is they could pull from a union hall. So they had these workers in their back pocket waiting to go, which was awesome because we had a really quick turnaround. So May 1st, they had their first class of about 20 to 25 installers that they were getting trained. Um, by the second week, they were out actually installing. Come August, the second vendor started. And so we were starting to kind of pick up steam. We were rolling. Come November, well, then someone, I think it was our VP, threw out Hmm, 5,000 installs, 500,000 installs this year. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a lot. So we worked, I'm like, okay, if I didn't have a vendor starting until May, and my second one didn't start till August, how about 400,000? That sounds more doable. So they said, okay, 400,000. Well, then, as we started going, the second vendor, the wheels started kind of falling off. Um, their attrition rate really picked up. Um, they were having new people every time, and we weren't getting the number of installs that we needed to do. And then weather hit. And all of a sudden, they were taking inclement days. I'm like, hey, hey, you don't get to take an inclement day. You need to work. But they took a couple inclement days, so our numbers started to, to plummet. So we ended up saying 370. That's really going to be our doable rate. Um, unfortunately, at the end of the month, we had a couple more um, days that were ba bad to work. They still worked, but they didn't get a lot done. So we ended up at 369, 218, so not bad, but we could explain it. And the other thing we found in November is that that number of 2% of stuff to do grew. It was like 4%. And so I'm on the mountain yelling to everybody, hey, I've got work. Does anybody want work? Our FO department didn't want work. They didn't want anything. I have 14,000 jobs I need to get done. No one wanted to do anything. So we also have some internal or external contractors that do some internal work. They replace our copper services. They work on mains and all that. But they slow down in our November and December months. So instead of laying them off, hey, can you keep some people? I got work. So I got approval to give 2,000 pieces of work to the vendors to say, hey. And luckily, we built a relationship with them, and they started doing some work. So 2019, hey, mass deployment, 1.2 million meters this year alone. Well, that's our internal goal. The EPI vendors, hey, guess what? You're doing 1.4. They don't know about the 1.2. They're doing 1.4. 
Well, we thought about that, um, and we're, we're get a, about to hit our 1.2 million just before Thanksgiving. So we're going to make that internal target. But they could probably do the 1.4, but it didn't make sense. Because now we're saying, okay, we need cleanup. We need that third attempt. We need that RTU back to us so we can go get meter work done to get it module installed. We need to get those areas closed because we need census in there. Hey, you know, is there an issue that you need to clear up? We can't do that yet because we need to get that work done. So we asked them to kind of change and get that cleanup done. And again, we might have to explain a few things, but at least we'll hit that 1.2. And I'm glad we didn't say 1.4 to our uh, external people or internal people. So the 1.2 is good. Um, we know in 2020 we're going to have about 600,000 we've got to go install, um, which seems very doable. And there's going to be some rollover, we know, in 2021 for things that we couldn't get to, but we're hoping it's really minimal. So our deployment strategy has changed. So EPI Vendor 1, they were the first person in the rodeo, first time they've ever done this, never done this kind of work at all. So they were here. Vendor 2, they had done it a ton of times. They're pros. They've done it, well, as the year changed and the wheels kind of rolled off, it shifted. So vendor one did an extreme amount doing really well. Vendor two, not so much. So we changed workload. Did it cause angst with vendor two? Yep. I mean, we still partnered, but we had to do what we had to do to make our numbers. So things changed that way. And even internally. So we have about 40 meter reading cycles with about eight, uh, 60 routes in every cycle. So our original thought is we're going to go into an office, we're going to knock out a whole cycle day. Well, meter reading called right away and said, hey, what are you doing? I got 12 meter readers. They can't do anything today. We've got nothing to do. And the next day, it was all hands on deck. So now we had to change our deployment. Because we didn't have network up in that, we're doing things different. So now we had to change our deployment. So instead of going one whole cycle day, um, we went to our vendors and like, can you deploy like this? So let's take the first four routes on every cycle day. And so we called it a corkscrew. It got very inventive. So we called it a corkscrew, and we started deploying in that manner. So what would have taken 12 readers to read, now they can do six on a consistent basis because we kept shrinking the routes in an in a equal way. So we changed our deployment either, even within our deployment. So these are our stats today. Um, we have about 240 installers every day. Um, we do 30 to 40 installs per person per day and about 5,000 installs a day. So 10,000 in roughly two days. So we did a whole bunch of work there with the vendors. Externally, a ton of work. But how do we get that message internally? How do we let our internal folks know what's going on? So like I said, 10,000, that first month in June, it took us a month to do 10,000. Now we're doing it 10,000 in, in two days. But I sat at home, like, how can I get the word out? How can billing and customer service know that something's going to happen? Because NICOR, we've been saying this forever. Oh, we're going to automate, it, automate re meter reading. I read meters 25 years ago, and they're saying, we're going to automate re meter reading, and you're going to lose your job. And, really? Guess what? It never happened. So we talk about it, and people roll their eyes. Oh, sure. They're going to do it. Yep. So I made my billboard, 10,000 on the back. I said, hey, ask me about it. I walked up and down NICOR. Every floor, I went into customer service. I went into billing. Hey, 10,000 modules installed. People roll their eyes. And it's like, OK, well, I'm trying to get the word out. And I sent Sandy a picture. I'm like, hey, it's 4th of July. Guess what? 30,000 modules installed. So I'm sitting in the, in the entryway of our geo office. 30,000 modules. And again, people are kind of laughing, kind of scared. Oops, there she is again. Uh, come September, we hit 100,000. I had my $100,000 bars, giving them out to everybody. Hey, we hit 100,000. Great. And people were getting excited. Except the president for NICOR Gas came to Sandy. He's like, hey, great. That girl's in the lobby again. She's handing out candy bars, 100,000 uh, deployed, but what are you billing? She pointed to Mike, what are you certified? I'm like, good, now you can get in the game. So our, our thing switched. Now it was certification. Now we have to say not only what we're deploying, but now what are we billing? So our, our things changed a little bit. We're still deploying a lot, but now we've got to report on our certification and billing. So from September to February, um, we had 500,000 modules. So that's me in the dinosaur suit, just in case you wondered. Um, 500,000. We went from the Stone Age to modern day. It's really happening. I mean, we're, we're doing it. And then come July, almost year to date, July 5th, we hit 1 million installs. So, yep, it's not a fantasy. We're halfway there, 1 million installs. So we were getting the word out. People were buying in. And at any given day in geo, they're like, oh, what are you going to dress up next? I'm like, I don't know, secret. 
But we're getting the word out. So our outcomes, oops, our outcomes basically, um, we're at, oh, that's wrong. We're at about 103 base stations installed. It may change. Um, today, we're at 1.55 million modules installed we hit today. We're still hovering about the 1.3 million certif certified, and we're rolling meter readers off on a consistent basis. And so our other outcomes, um, seamless transfer of data. We're billing. We're getting more accurate. Um, it's getting out quicker. We're lessening the access issues. We don't have access issues to get into places anymore because we're getting installs. And we're having fewer, fewer cancel and rebuild bills. And again, I, this is the largest technology project that NICOR Gas had ever had on our um, one millionth celebration. So not only do we celebrate that one million hey installs, it's again, what are we doing with the reads? So we came up with, hey, got reads? And you wouldn't believe how jealous people got. It's like, can we get that shirt? I'm like, you're kidding. But we got a lot of requests for that. Um, but that's it in a nutshell. That's been our deployment plan. So I don't know if people have any questions. So um, they're doing the exact same work. Um, the union-based pool is from um, the labor union. And so they have a little stronger parameters. If you're going to be a labor union, um, you need to show up. You know, they get paid more, but they've got some longevity to it. After they stay on this program, they maybe be able to roll on to uh, underground labor, or they've got some longevity to it. The non-union is just a vendor that's going to kind of come and go. They came in at a lot lesser pay rate. Um, and I told Sandy very early on in the project, before they even started, like, like really? It's like a $10 difference. Um, you get paid more at Amazon, and you don't have to be out in the elements, and you don't have to do things. I'm like, we're going to struggle. And so that's what happened. They really started a tritting. So we worked with them to actually up their pay rate um, to be a little bit more substantial. But again, I think their issue is people don't see it long term. It's good for a while, but other things come along and they move on. So that's kind of the difference we've seen between the union and non-union. And we kept it separate um, just for that reason. And, and because we're a union-based company, we had to explain that to our employees too. You know, you come across these people, they're non-union, it's okay. They're not doing work that we would do, so just let it go. So that was kind of an issue we had between the union and non-union. Anything else from anybody? Well, it all depends. So we do sample meter, they did sample meter testing, so that's going to continue. We change about 60,000 meters a year. Um, and we'll probably put it in place sometime, you know, to start that process, but because it's a 20-year battery life, um, probably a lot of those meters will be changed before that time because it continues to go. So, anything else from anybody? Awesome, I appreciate it. And again, if you could take the survey at the end, it would be helpful. Awesome. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>